several years ago, uh, took my brother and my family out to eat out. And she done with the order to sit down and start to eat. And my little girl said, aren't you going to say the prayer? And I was so embarrassed. I never <laughs> sat down to eat a meal without that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very, very good to see everyone tonight. As you know, we're coming to the end of this series, The Ultimate Gift. Uh, you've been very kind with the remarks that you've made concerning this class. I've enjoyed teaching this class, looking at not just the movie. These gifts, of course, are in the movie by the same name, The Ultimate Gift. But when you take those gifts and look at them biblically, they really become very, very powerful. These are 12 things that we need to keep in mind on a daily basis. Now, tonight, it just so happens we have to look at two of these gifts. And I know that's comical because really, we, even when we look at one, I'm running through it. Uh, if you'll remember, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the gift of dreams. And at the close of that study, I told you that one of the studies we'd have to double up on. And then Doug Gwynn, my great friend, uh, he made a remark that I'm taking as an insult, no, really, as a challenge. He said, well, you are dreaming, you know, so I guess... I guess he doesn't think we can get to, through two of these tonight. But look at your handout. We're dealing with lesson 11, the gift of gratitude, and also lesson 12, the gift of a day. Now, already prefacing what we're saying, both of these demand more time than we can give them tonight. They're both independent studies. Uh, tonight, it would be hard to get through the gift of gratitude, let alone the gift of a day on top of that. But let's do this. Uh, I still want you to make comments, but we'll probably ask for those comments a little bit more infrequently than normal. But raise your hand, make your comment as, as concise, as quick as you can, and let's take some time tonight to think about these two gifts, gratitude and also a day. It's interesting, when you think back about the movie, and by the way, we had a request for those uh, CDs that we're passing out for the movie. We had a couple of them. If you've already watched it and you're going to turn it back in, please do so quickly. We still have some who want to see that. And so in the movie, Jason, the grandson, the one that I've mentioned a few times, remember, he's spoiled, he's wealthy, it's, he's pretty worthless. Uh, regarding the human race, others. He's always thinking about himself. But as he starts this process, going through what his grandfather, Red Stevens, wants him to encounter through these gifts, he begins to mature, he begins to mellow. And at one point, he has worked for a whole month concerning uh, the gift of work, and when he gets the check, he's told for the next gift, as much as you need that money, you find someone who needs it more. Well, of course, Alexia and her daughter Emily. Emily is the little girl with leukemia. Uh, she is very ill. And he finds out that they owe back rent. And so he takes that money that he needed desperately and he applies it to her rent. And later on in the movie, she says someone took up my back rent, was it you? And then she said, thank you. And that really is expressing the gift of gratitude. Thank you. He did something very kind, noble, certainly for him. And again, the response was a heartfelt thank you. Now, every day of our lives, we have so much to thank God for. And I fear that at times, all of us, are sort of like the nine, the ten lepers who were healed. Only one turned back and gave thanks, glorifying God with a loud voice. Jesus said, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Every day God blesses us with all the blessings. And I wonder how many times do we stop, do we pause 
during the day to say thank you, express our gratitude. David said in Psalm 119, verse 164, seven times a day do I praise you. And so let's think about that. How many times today have you stopped to render thanksgiving? Just to offer a heartfelt thanks to our Father who blesses us with every good and perfect gift. Now, read the introduction with me, then we'll look at these quotes very quickly. But the introduction says, How is gratitude defined, depicted, and demonstrated? Webster defines gratitude by stating, quote, the state of being grateful, thankfulness. Gratitude is depicted as someone's greatest possession, Psalm 92 and verse 1, or someone's tragic loss, Luke 17, verses 15 through 18. Again, in Psalm 92 and verse 1, that verse simply begins by saying, it is good to give thanks to the Lord. Uh, it is a possession that each one of us should have, can have. And of course, Luke 17 is what we just mentioned. Uh, those lepers who were so overjoyed, they forgot to give thanks. Continue to read with me. It says, thus gratitude is demonstrated by both lip and life. Let's make sure to express thanks with our words and by our ways. Now, go through these quotes with me. Notice, the first one says, Everything we do should be a result of our gratitude for what God has done for us. I think all of us agree with that wholeheartedly. Everything we do, again, should be a result of our gratitude for what God has done for us. You remember in 1 Samuel 12 and verse 24? Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all of your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. I think if we spent more time in consideration, if we spent more time, as the gospel song says, count your many blessings, we would be spending more time offering thanks. Uh, you remember also in Psalm 126 and verse 3, he has done great things for us. We are glad. And not only glad, but we could also add, he's done great things for us. We are grateful. Well, look at the next quote. Gratitude to God makes even a temporal blessing a taste of heaven. The next one, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude, now listen to this, I love this, and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Now think about that. We should be amazed. We should stand in wonder every day that God loves us this much, that God cares about us so much, that God has given us so much, that he's blessed us in so many ways. And so notice that last phrase again, that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. The next one, happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is a spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. You know, when you look at the first half of that quotation, that's our time, that's our people, that's our nation, really that's the world, that's humanity. We try to find happiness by going to some destination, by buying something, owning something. You don't find happiness like that. Uh, you find happiness, again, by appreciating. God's blessings in your life. Look at the next one. Saying thank you is more than good manners. It is good spirituality. And the last one on the front page. There is not a more pleasing exercise of the mind than gratitude. Flip this over, if you will. Look on the inside, some more quotes. Gratitude is the best attitude. The next one, silent gratitude isn't much use to anyone. The next one, gratitude is the music of the heart when its chords are swept by the breeze of kindness. He who forgets the language of gratitude can never be on speaking terms with happiness. These two go together. You notice how many quotes are joining happiness and gratitude? Uh, you look at people around you who are happy, and they are grateful people, aren't they? Flip it over. Look at those that are unhappy, that are miserable. And again, 
they typically are not filled with thanks. They're, they're ingrates, to say the least. And so these two things go together, hand in hand. Look at the next quote, if you will. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Now, this is a very practical application. I mean, how, how do you take things? I know in my own life, sometimes I'm too many times taking things for granted. That's what we do. But as this quote points out, we need to take things with gratitude and, and be thankful for what we have. Notice the next quote, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all the others. Gratitude is the sign of noble souls. Now look at Joseph Stalin here, how sad this is. He said one time, gratitude is a sickness suffered by dogs. Um, you know, you don't have to say much concerning that. But just think about how miserable someone would have to be to have that concept with regard to gratitude and thanksgiving. Look at the next one. When a person doesn't have gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. And this next one, we are told that people stay in love because of chemistry or because they remain intrigued with each other or because of many kindnesses, because of luck. But part of it has got to be forgiveness and gratefulness. We're talking about earlier the marriage retreat, building families. Well, once again, here's something that can help the family. Gratitude, thanksgiving being expressed by one and being expressed by all. Notice also, gratitude is riches, complaint is poverty. Well, these are some helpful quotes. If you're gonna be teaching a lesson on gratitude, again, here's some quotes that can at least help start that lesson. But look at these questions now. And let's have some very quick observations, some very quick discussion regarding these. But the question is the first one, what's your favorite verse regarding gratitude and thanksgiving? Does anyone have one that you want to share with us, that you want to read to the rest of us? Jack? I'm just thinking, I can't think of a verse, but it seems like every time Paul writes something, he says, thanks be to God. Okay. He really does. Paul was one that was filled with gratitude. Uh, we mentioned tonight earlier, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And so, you know, there's a verse that we need to remember, uh, something that we need to remember what David said in Psalm 119 and verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so that's a verse that we need to hide in our hearts, that we need to put to memory that we will remember to be thankful and grateful people. Anything else? I'm going to be turning to something. Doug? Okay. Okay. You, you simply can't beat that verse. And, and you know what Paul is doing as he, you know, offsets anxiety in our anxious ways be anxious for what in nothing but in everything so notice the contrast be anxious in nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God then it goes on to say if we'll do that if we'll stop being so anxious as a people and start being grateful and thankful in everything the promises and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So peace is something that we strive toward, that we want to, you know, possess. Well, there's the answer. Stop letting anxiety and worry, you know, just tear you up and start being grateful, thankful, prayerful in everything. And there's the peace of God. Turn with me to a couple of verses. Notice in Ephesians, turn with me to Ephesians 5. Look what verse 20 tells us. 
Ephesians 5 and verse 20, and his whole context, of course, is, is just wonderful. But look at verse 20. It says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, giving thanks always for all things. And so all the time giving thanks for what? You know, we say, how can we give thanks always? What are we giving thanks for? For all things, for everything. Uh, look, if you will, at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. Remember what it says? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so when you look at what the Bible teaches us, God for our own good, for our own mental health, for our emotional health, and certainly, as some of the quotes indicated, for our spiritual well-being. God encourages us, he teaches us to be grateful, to be thankful, to express our gratitude, thanksgiving. Any other verses? Jack? I just have to talk. Okay. Uh, we ought to be, we should give thanks for our burdens because we don't have other people's burdens. Okay. Which will be worse. Okay. Jack said, you know, we can even give thanks for our burdens because they're ours, they're not someone else's. We think we have it bad, but then have you ever stopped to look at what other people are dealing with? And, you know, one man had written one time that if humanity were to take their burdens and cast them in a little, you know, pile, a mountain, if you will, and then get to choose what burdens they would take, we'd probably all take our own because so many others have more difficult things that they're dealing with. And so count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. Uh, James 1 and verse 2. Well, look, if you will, at this next question. Why should we be grateful, thankful? Simple question, but why? Anybody have a, an answer to that, a response to that? Why should we be grateful? So many times the Bible tells us to be, but why? Give us one good reason. Jack? Well, we have such a loving Father. Okay. We, we have such a loving Father. I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Psalms, and this will be the only verse I'll mention regarding this, but in Psalm 107, look at Psalm 107. If I can get over there to it. Four times in this psalm, we're going to read the same observation, the same statement. And it's a powerful one. This psalm is really divided by this stanza. But look what it says in Psalm 107 and verse 8. Now, we're only going to read verse 8, but you're going to find it also in verse 15 and verse 21 and in verse 31. But look at what David says. Oh, that men should give thanks to the Lord, now notice, for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. We sit around at times and we wonder, well, why should we be grateful? Why should we be thankful? This one context gives us two very good reasons. Why, again, for his goodness, because, as Jack mentioned, because we have such a loving Father in heaven. Give thanks for his goodness and for his wonderful works among men. We mentioned, you know, the verse already. Uh, he's done great things for us. We are glad. Well, that's, that's taking those wonderful works and, and understanding how good God has been to us how much he's blessed us. And so for those reasons alone, we should be more than willing to give thanks. Now, number three, number three, for what are you grateful? We need more people responding to this. For what are you grateful? What's, what's one thing, Frederick? I thank God for Jesus. I'm grateful. Okay. Thank God for that gift that he gave. Remember, we've emphasized this throughout this series we're talking about the ultimate gift, and without a doubt, without a doubt, as we look at 
all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, at the top of those spiritual blessings is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16. Frederick said he's thankful for Jesus, for the salvation that is found in Christ. And every day, every day we have something to be thankful for. You know, in Philippians 4 and verse 4, we talked about Philippians 4, 6, and 7. But in Philippians 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, the reason God's child can rejoice in the Lord always now that's the key. If it just said rejoice in the Lord, we'd say, I do that once in a while. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says rejoice in the Lord always. Lord, you mean even in my affliction, even in my suffering, even when I'm going through heartache, even during times of sorrow, even when I'm shedding tears, even when I'm hurt, even when I'm alone, even when I'm desperate, even when others that I care about are hurting. What do you mean always? How can we do that always? Well, the key is we're not rejoicing. God doesn't say in that context, rejoice in your misery, rejoice in your heartache. He says rejoice in the Lord. Now, even when we're experiencing all those things, we're still in Christ. We can still rejoice in Him, in His person, in His presence, in His power, in His pardon, in His promises. So rejoice in the Lord. The Bible doesn't say get happy because you're being martyred. Uh, it's not just simply for the sake of martyrdom. It's because we're in Christ. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They'll rest from their labors. Their works follow after them. What else are we thankful for? What should we be thankful for? Llewellyn? Okay, very good. How simple is that? The Bible class teachers teaching my children. We're talking about gratitude. How many times when you've gone to pick up your child have you told that teacher, thank you. I am so grateful for them to have a teacher like you who cares. You know, that's what we're talking about. Uh, we, we can be like the lepers and just, you know, go pick them up and, and turn and not say boo to the teachers or wonder why the teacher's given my child a memory verse to commit to, to memory. We ought to be thankful for that. And so every day we have so many things to be grateful for. Our problem is sometimes we're not, we're not looking uh, at what we should be grateful for. We're not looking to be grateful initially. If we'll open up our eyes to gratitude, then we'll find so many things that we can say thank you, not only to God, but to others for. Thank you. Brother Paul, did you have your hand up? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm thankful that God has become a known straight person. To me, God is like a, a union. Uh, you know, on the, on the union chart, uh, I can see, the reason I say that, that's because a long time ago, we could go get a job. Very, very good. God's no respecter person. How thankful every one of us needs to be regarding that. Uh, I most certainly understand that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation he who fears him and works righteousness is welcome to him. That's what Peter realized as a Jew. It was a hard lesson for him to learn. Three times God sent that vision of the sheet and the food and telling Peter to arise and kill and eat, and he says, nope. Never have eaten anything unclean. Well, the unclean part of that was not regarding just the application of that food, that meat, but the Gentiles, the Jews, thought the Gentiles were unclean. So Peter finally figured out that vision. I most certainly understand that God is not one to show partiality. God doesn't say clean, unclean, simply because of race, 
of how much money we have in the bank. No, everyone who fears him and works righteousness is welcome to him. That's something that everyone can be so very thankful for. Now, let's do this. Go on to this fourth question. How do you demonstrate gratitude? Well, we mentioned earlier by lip, by what we say, and by life, by how we conduct ourselves. And we need both of those in unison, don't we? We don't need to say thank you to God and then live as an ingrate. We need to say thank you and then let our lives demonstrate that gratitude. Look at the last question. What does ingratitude look like to God? You ever thought about that? We know what it looks like to man. That next question, what does it look like to man? It's not a pretty sight, is it? When you see ingratitude in children, whether it's your own or others, when their parents love them, care for them, provide for them, and, and here's seemingly an ingrate, it's not a pretty picture. It doesn't look good at all. What does it look like to God? I think we get a glimpse of that in Luke 17. Jesus asking the question, were not ten cleansed? It's just inconceivable, it's unbelievable to God that he can pour out, open up the windows of heaven, pour out blessings that we're not even able to receive, and still we turn around and forget to say thank you. Let me, let me ask you to turn to one context, because this, if it wasn't so serious, to me this would be comical. In the book of Jonah, turn to the book of Jonah, and you remember Jonah, he, he's told to go to Nineveh. He runs the opposite direction. But in the belly of the fish, he comes to the conclusion that, you know what? I need to do what God tells me to do. But notice the wording of this. In Jonah, the second chapter, now remember, he's in the belly of the fish. Uh, during difficult times, here's what he says. He's brought to his senses. And so in Jonah 2 and verse 9, he says, and this is the ultimate, this is the climax for Jonah. It goes downhill from here. It starts out pretty bad. It gets to that climax, that mountaintop of faith, and then it goes on a downward, you know, slope very quickly with Jonah. But here's what he says at the top of this. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. And then he says, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Well, the fish spits him out. He quickly forgets those words. It's almost as soon as he gets those words out of his mouth, he spits them out too. He's forgotten them. He goes to Nineveh reluctantly. He doesn't want to do what God says, but he does. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. They repent, and then Jonah, in essence, repents that he went. He's mad that he went to Nineveh. He's mad at God for showing compassion. And so God's trying to show him, hey, shouldn't I be compassionate to this multitude of people? But look, at here's, here's the comical thing, the sad thing. In chapter 4 and verse 6, notice it says, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head, to deliver him from his misery. Now listen to this. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Really? Grateful, Jonah, for the plant? Am I reading this right? He's not grateful for the souls that have been rescued, not grateful for the souls that have been saved. He's grateful for the gourd. And I think sometimes we get ourselves as confused as Jonah. We have all these spiritual blessings, and we're thankful for the plant. We're thankful for the gourd. Well, look at this now. Lest I prove Doug right, we've got to get into this second study. Look at this, Lesson 12, The Gift of a Day. Here's the quotes. Every day should be passed as if it were to be our last. Simple wisdom, isn't it? Every day should be passed as if it were our last. Thank God every morning when you get up that you have something to do that day which must be done whether you like it or not. <laughs> and there's part of the key right there. Whether you like it or not, thank God. I never had a policy. I have just tried to do my very best each and every day. Abraham Lincoln said that. Just think, if, if that's what motivated us, the gift of a day, 
Think of, think of what God has blessed us with in today. He, he's granted us to be alive. We can continue to serve him today. And so Abraham Lincoln, I don't have a policy. I just try to do the very best I can every day. Well, every child of God should say the same thing. The next one, you can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. The next one, a day wasted on others is not wasted on oneself. <laughs> Typically, that's what we do, don't we? It's sad when we do something for someone else that we would even consider that day wasted because we don't mind wasting a lot of time on ourselves. But when we do it for others, it's wasted. Notice the next one. Uh, write, and of course, here's a typo. Instead of write is, it says, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. You know, if that was our outlook, I think we'd be surprised that this became true. That if we approached every day that this is the best day of this year, of 2013, this is the best day that I've lived thus far. Maybe we would live better lives with that outlook. Notice the last quote here. The best thing about the future is that it comes one day at a time. Turn over to the fourth page, some more quotes. Put off for one day and 10 days will pass. Now we put that because the value, uh, the gift of a day, don't, don't squander time. That's really what Ephesians 5 and verse 16 is all about, is it not? Uh, we're taught in that context not to be squandering time, but to redeem the time. Why? For the days are evil. That term redeem means buy it up. Uh, don't let it be found lost, squandered. Uh, prodigal. You remember the prodigal son? Uh, that simply means wasteful. The son was wasteful. He wasted not only his substance, but his time. He was wasting his life in that far distant country. Notice the next one. Someday is not a day of the week. Remember that, because the next time you say, I'm going to do that someday, remember that simple quote, someday is not a day of the week. Let's get more specific. What day are you going to do this? Uh, notice, as a well-spent day brings happy sleep, so a, well -spent, uh, so a life well-spent brings happy death. <laughs> Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. The day which we fear as our last is but the birthday of eternity. Again, remember, all of these are emphasizing a day, the gift of a day. Notice, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. You know, when you look at that and you keep in mind Thomas Paine said it in the time in which he spoke that, that's one of the most unselfish quotes I've ever read. Look at it again. If there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. Notice the next one. Every day I get up and look through the Forbes list of the richest people in America. If I'm not there, I go to work. Well, pretty good. The gift of a day. Get, get to work. And this last one, I've been on a diet for two weeks, and all I've lost is 14 days. I uh, Ever experienced the same thing? The gift of a day. Do you remember what inspiration tells us in 2 Peter 3? The scoffers are asking the question, where is the promise of his coming? For every since our fathers fell asleep, everything's continued as it was. Well, Peter tells him, you know what? You're willfully ignorant in the very next verse. And then really in answering that question, he shows them. Why, you know, hasn't God come? That's what their point is. Where is the promise of his coming? Peter says, let me tell you why he hasn't come. Verse 9, he's not willing for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Peter really puts their question back on them. He says, you're wondering where is the promise of his coming? Oh, he's coming. He's promised he's coming. He will. But he's giving us this time because he doesn't want us to perish. He wants us to repent. And Peter's saying, you're not using your time too wisely, are you? You're not repenting of your sins. A few verses later, he drops down in verse 15, and we are to count the patience of God, his long-suffering, as salvation. Peter's reinforcing that point. 
those who are in Christ, those who are saved, the reason why we are is because God gave us the time to hear about Christ, to come to Him in obedience. And so instead of throwing time up in God's face, where's the promise of His coming? We need to understand God has given us all time to come back to Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to get in the proper relationship with Him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So let's count the patience, the long-suffering of God as salvation. If He wasn't long-suffering, if He wasn't patient, we'd all be lost. Now, look at this quote here. This is one I use for our invitation. And again, I think it's very straightforward. I think, to me at least, it's, it's very thought-provoking. God gave you a gift of 86,400 seconds today. Have you used one to say thank you? Now, that indicts me. Uh, I didn't put this down here to make anyone feel guilty, but it, it does indict me. Uh, I think if we're honest, it indicts all of us, but that's not the purpose for it, to wake us up, to stir us up. You know what? Let's be more grateful. Let's think about what the Bible says about gratitude, and when you put them together, about being thankful for every day that God has given us. What a great gift, the gift of a day. Now, look at these verses here. Uh, the verses here, and all of these have something to do with a day, okay? Uh, in Psalm 74, in verse 16, David is speaking to God. Now, the application we're going to make is, is not so much to God, but I think the same thing is true about us. But in Psalm 74 and verse 16, David says, The day is yours, and the night also is yours. Now, he's talking about God as creator, the God who gave us light, the God who gave us night. The day is yours, and the night also is yours. But you know what? God, in essence, blessing us with time, God says to me, Ken, the day is yours, and the night is yours. And really the point should be, how am I going to use this day? How am I going to use the night that God has given me? Well, look at the ne next verse. In Psalm 145 and verse 2, David simply begins by saying, Every day I will bless you. Now, again, that should be the outcome, shouldn't it? Every day. Every day that God has given us, I will bless you. In Psalm 44 and verse 8, listen to what this says at the beginning. It says, in God we boast all day long. And that's what we should do, the gift of a day. Use it to God's glory. Uh, not to be boasting about self, but boasting in God all day long. Psalm 89 and verse 16, in your name they rejoice all the day. Well, that's pretty good use of a day, isn't it? Rejoicing in God boasting in God, glorying in Him, giving Him praise and honor, offering to Him thanksgiving and gratitude. In Psalm 118 and verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You see, every day that's true, this is the day that the Lord has made. And so let's rejoice and be glad in it. In Psalm 84 and verse 10, remember what David says there? One day, now emphasize that, one day in your courts is worth a thousand outside. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. Whether you apply that verse and its meaning to this life or the next life, I believe it can, can be applied either way. But it's true. One day in fellowship with God, in true communion with Him, is worth a thousand outside. One day in Christ, one day in His church, it's worth a thousand in the world. And that's what David's saying. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. You give me the lowest position, whether you're talking about spiritually in this life, in the church, or in heaven, 
You give me the lowest position, doorkeeper, I'll be glad to do it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. He's saying, I would rather be a doorkeeper than to be magnified in this world, have the highest position, the highest calling. And so what a great use of a day to recognize that that's how valuable one day is. That's how wonderful one day serving the Lord is. It's worth a thousand outside of Him because they're all wasted. You remember in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The point is, any labor outside of Christ, it is in vain. Work for a thousand days outside of Christ, and it's all vanity. It's all striving after the wind. It's all empty, shallow, useless. But one day in Christ, even as a doorkeeper, the lowest position possible, it's worth all the time that we could spend upon this earth. Notice the next quote. I mentioned this earlier. Seven times a day I will praise you. Well, again, pretty good use of time, isn't it? Pretty good use of a day. In Psalm 7 and verse 11, I know this is a little different tenor in using verses that mention a day, but notice what this says. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Some people want to know why. Well, what we're talking about tonight furnishes a very good reason why God is angry. He's given us a day. He's given us life, and we're squandering it. God has a right to be angry with the wicked every day because of what they're doing with the time given them. I think it was Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth one time she said, all my possessions for one more moment. And I'll guarantee you this, when we come to the end of this life, if we're outside of Christ, that's what people want. They want one more moment. They want one more opportunity to get right. Why? Because they know they've squandered their time. That precious possession that God has given us, 86,400 seconds every day. Multiply that over the span of your life. Think about how much time God has granted you. And our question should be, what have I done with it? Am I using it, employing it gainfully to His honor, to His glory? Matthew 6 and verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. You know, the Bible teaches, we'll notice this in Matthew 6 and verse 34, but the Bible teaches us to live this day for the Lord. Don't get so caught up in worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, don't get upset about what's happened in the past. If it's not good, repent of it. God forgives you of that past. But this day is what God has given us. You remember in 1 Samuel 14, in verse 45, it's the last verse we have down here. It's speaking concerning Jonathan. But concerning Jonathan, he's paid one of the greatest compliments in all the Bible. The people say he, Jonathan, has worked with God this day. That's what the faithful child of God does every day. He's a fellow worker with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. A fellow laborer, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. Now, I know in some of those contexts, it's speaking in the sense of apostles. But again, the point is, every child of God who's faithful is working with the Lord. If you're not with Him, you're against Him. And so, not being against Him, we're, we're with Him, we're laboring with Him. Wouldn't it be great if people could say about us, He, she has worked with God this day. You can't put the day to better use than right there. You remember Joshua 24 and verse 15? Choose you this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. All of us have a choice every day of our lives. The choice is, are we going to be grateful? Or are we going to be those who like that leech Remember Proverbs 30 and verse 15, the leech has two daughters, give and give. Is that how we're going to approach God? God, you've done pretty good so far, and you can do a lot more, so I want you to give and give. 
Or are we going to make a choice to be grateful this day? And are we going to make a choice to use this day to God's honor and glory? Now, we've said a lot. I know we've ran through this quickly. I did so just for Doug's benefit. No. Really, these are, I, I wish we had more time to spend, but in the last few minutes, any other observations, any other comments? Jack? Going back to question three, for what are we grateful? I'm grateful that I have God's real word in a language I can understand, a format I can read, and all the helps, uh, study helps I can ever use. Okay. Thankful for the word of God, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You know, that, that psalm, that analogy there, it's been said that the ancients would wear foot candles, little candles that they'd strap on their foot. And so at night when they would walk, they'd have a light on their feet. It would help them navigate where they were going. Well, the psalmist is using that reality and he's saying, your word is a light unto my feet and a lamp to my path. So God's word illuminates our way. We know what to do. We know the way to go. We know how to travel because of God's word. And Jack says he's thankful for that. So many things do this tonight, not just before, quote, you go to bed, but as you leave, as you go home, be thinking about things that you should be more grateful for. Be thinking about what we've talked about tonight. You have the choice. You're the only one that can make the choice about being grateful, about being thankful. And you're the only one that can use every day, every moment, every second that God gives you to his glory. And so choose you this day whom you'll serve. And all of us should respond like Joshua. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord and we'll be grateful for that opportunity. So we've concluded both lessons with about five, six, seven seconds to spare. Just doesn't get any better than that, does it? Didn't let you speak much tonight. I apologize for that. <laughs> One more comment, and then that's it. <laughs> God has given each one of us his word, and so we don't have to depend upon anyone else. Now, again, we ought to be grateful for others who can help us and encourage us, but the bottom line is, just like Brother Paul said, you know, God's no respecter of persons, and so you can serve him faithfully. I can serve him faithfully. He's given us his word to ensure that we know him. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So if we're like the Bereans, and if we'll receive the word with eagerness and study every day to see if these things be so, that's nobility of mind before God. Appreciate your comments. Appreciate you holding some of the comments tonight so we can, we can get through the study, but good to see everyone. Next week, the gift of love. The gift of love.